Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Father John Powis fights every day against the great sin of eviction and homelessness. Supposedly, he retired late last year, but still you can find him in Bushwick, climbing the stairs of an old building, or spending hours in the housing court on Fulton Street. You are really Monsignor Powis, yeah, right? That's right? Yes. How did you become such an activist priest? I mean, have you always been that way? Yes, I have. I, I you know, I was trained uh, differently than priests are being trained today. Uh, I got a great break uh, about three years before I was ordained a priest, and a priest friend of mine, uh, my senior James Coffey, uh, suggested that I work a couple of summers downtown Brooklyn, and I worked in the Fort Greene and Farragut projects. And right then and there, it struck me that you're dealing with a human being. It's 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 a whole it's a whole entity. You can't just preach one thing and the spiritual and not deal with the whole human being. And uh, after I was ordained, I ended up being back in that same neighborhood for four years, and they were just wonderful, wonderful years that I look back to now. Yeah. And I got to know at one point every family in the, the Fort Greene project, whether they were Catholic or non-Catholic, simply by going out every day and visiting them. Were their problems different from problems of poor people today? I think there was, there's always different problems and different things. You know, in the projects, we were more or less just dealing with people from the point of view of their needs of getting jobs and things like that. I, I was then transferred to Brownsville, and I was 25 years in a church on Eastern Parkway and Rockaway Avenue. And uh, there we were dealing with much more, I mean, just incredible problems. The schools... Uh, were, were, were in a well, that was the of, day of Ocean Hill Brownsville. Those were the days of Ocean <laughs> Hill Brownsville, and I was the only white member of that board, and uh, sometimes I've been criticized for that. But actually, it could have been a wonderful uh, experiment. We tried very hard to do a, a busing of young people so that we would have integration. Mm -hmm. We had all the children in Brownsville at that time were going two separate sessions, one from 8 to 12, and another whole group would come from 12 to, to 4. It was really a disaster. And there was a lot of underutilized buildings, and we bust 1,700 kids once one year out to all those areas where the schools were half empty, and the reaction of the people was just horrendous. I mean, they just didn't let them exist, and they put them in separate separate floors, and it was it was a sad experiment. And then, then the board of education asked us to do the the Ocean Hill Brownsville demonstration school district, and that was going fine with the union and with everybody until the state commissioner said, we're going to let you have principals uh, that are not on the civil service list. Well, as soon as that happened, then everybody turned against it. Uh, and mm. it was sad That's because so, at that point, there was only one black principal in the whole city, no Hispanic, no Asian, and we were the first ones to introduce When was this that. in 1960? This was in 66 six. and 67, and uh, it, it could have been a wonderful thing. Uh, it... Uh, it, 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 uh, but, but again, the idea was that I was always going to be involved in people's and people's lives and the education of children. Uh, in Ocean Hill Browns, we also started uh, dealing with the Industrial Areas Foundation, and we That's formed the, the East Brooklyn Congregation, right? <laughs> and we've built 3,000 Nehemiah homes. And every time I, I went to visit a couple of families a couple of weeks ago, one lives on, um, on Junior Street in Brownsville, and they only pay three eighty five a month for their mortgage. These are this is in Brooklyn. This is in, in an area that was really a Just blighted bombed area. Out. It bombed was, out. You would think was, you were in I remember it was awful. We I was going, there and at, at one point I was the seven eighth administrator of twenty two large buildings. It was it was seven eight from the from, uh, from, H, from, from the, the housing court, department from the, court, from the court. From the court. And and, and uh, along came the Nehemiah houses, which are uh, ownership of their houses. Of their houses. And, and they're, they're just they're attached but single family houses. Single family houses and the, there's either two or three bedrooms, a backyard. Uh, the latest ones that we built along Dumont and down around Williams Avenue are, are even more beautiful and they only pay five eighty five a month. We're gonna be building some in Spring Creek now. We had to put it in the newspapers. We got 22,000 applications oh within two weeks. So the need of housing at this point and the tremendous crisis in the city as far as poor families and not only poor family but moderate working moderate families, um, it is desperate. We Good. go to court every day and we see things that are 
that are heart-wrenching. You know, You're uh, jumping ahead of me, but I want right. to know your family and how you became a priest to begin with. Well, we grew up in a place called City Lion, which is the end of East New York and the beginning of uh, Queens, uh, Woodhaven and, and Ozone Park, the three mm -hmm. come together there. I was one of ten children. Nine of us are still alive. Um, we, uh, we were in a church very close. I, the, the priests there were very good. From the time that I was very young, I always wanted to be a priest. Not that I used to you know, hang out in the rectory or anything, because I had my group, a large group of friends that we hung out every day, played ball for six or eight hours a day. And You're a big baseball fan, right? Big baseball fan. <laughs> you, worked and, uh, at, you worked at Ebbets Field? Yeah, and the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the days when I was working at Fort Greene and Farragut, I really wasn't, I was working very hard, but we weren't getting paid. Oh. We were just working with young people and uh, going on trips. We used to take 250 kids to Coney Island on the F train uh, twice a week. It was, it was quite an experience. But at nights, we worked at Ebbets Field and Yankee Stadium, to, depending on who was home. And uh, they were wonderful days, because those were the days of Jackie Robinson and yeah. Duke Snyder. And did you go to college, or did you just, did you go to high school and then to study for no, the... No, the, the, the high school was a preparatory seminary on Washington, and, on Washington Avenue in Atlantic. Uh, it is now housing. But, um, and then we did four years of high school there and two years of college. Then we went to the seminary out in Huntington. We did the last two years of college and four years of theology. But all of those years, every time I got a chance to come home, uh, my, my idea was the more you could learn by working in communities and getting to know people rather than taking a job like on Wall Street or something like that. That was what Did your do. family do that too? No, my no. family, my family was, uh, you know, they've done, they've done very well. They've do, I have a brother who's a, uh, a very close to the uh, Bushes and the Reagans and all of them because he was in the, he was the head of the Secret <laughs> Service for a while. He was a, an assistant uh, secretary of the Treasury. Uh, so he, so he's, he's, he's the oldest of us all. But um, no, they were not involved in the same uh, things. But yeah. uh, I found that those years were those formative years, and then being ordained and being, first of all, before I was sent to the, to, the, to down to Fort Greene and Farragut after being ordained, we were also sent for a summer down south um. to learn the culture of, I, we were in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and I used to spend the afternoons in Friendship House. And uh, then right after ordination, we were sent to Puerto Rico with Ivan Illich, and we studied language and culture. And that was, again, a great experience because we were working in the Campo Support. And you're field. fluent then in Spanish, right, so you're very absolutely. good. Now, let's talk about Bushwick because right. that's where your most recent church was, St. Barbara's. How right. many years were you there? I'm there 16 years. And uh, I, all together with administration and everything, <laughs> I, I felt that after doing administration for about 36 years, that that was enough. enough. And I'm 71. And uh, You're a baby. I wanted to, I wanted to <laughs> retire, but I didn't really. I want to retire from being uh, uh, that I had to deal with the buildings and the. And you don't the want pipes to be an administrator or a bureaucrat. No, no administrator, right. no, that. Uh. So, uh, so we, 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 I was seeing the last two years at St. Barbara's the number of families that were coming into the rectory, constantly saying the same thing. They were working. They were working very hard, but they couldn't pay the rent. And the same thing that happened in Williamsburg is now happening in Bushwick. What's the constituency in St. Barbara's? Uh, the congregation uh, would be, I guess, about 85 percent Hispanic and about 15 percent uh, Afro-American. When you started there, it was a small parish? No, it I was, mean, a it small was, it congregation? Was, it was doing, it was it was doing, doing quite fine. well, but uh, I think the many things that we did that involved the community uh, made it even much bigger. Right. It's a very big... When I first got there, there were still large areas of the parish that were were, were still burned out that you could see uh, yeah. y years ago you could sit and you could stand in uh, St. Barbara's and look for miles around you. It was all burned out. Then a very good project was built. The best uh, city housing authority development was built in, in, in Bushwick. 92 buildings, all low rise, no elevators, and 12 mm -hmm. families per building. Mm -hmm. Beautifully planned and executed and, and done very nicely. And why, why hasn't that model been followed more? We well, the, because the housing authority isn't, isn't doing any more building, you know. And then now what's happening in Bushwick is that um, there is a lot of two-family and three-family buildings being built. Uh, the city is giving large subsidies so that people can, so that builders can get in and get out. Uh, and they, they give a second mortgage to people, which is a lot. 
But the biggest thing about Bushwick at the moment is that there's about 700 rent-stabilized buildings very close together. And, you know, and any time a what, mayor... four or, or five a, stories high? Yeah, they're, they're, most, they're of them are six, most of them are six families. Right. Some of them are 20, some of them are 16, mm -hmm. but most of them are six. Now, if you have a housing shortage, like we have in New York now, and you don't really protect that, that six or 700 buildings, there's something wrong. There's something, I think this present mayor and the commissioner of HPD, they have the idea that um, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. You know, if the market is calling for this, if people are moving in from Manhattan, uh, up to just a couple of years ago, all the factories along Whitecourt Avenue were where our very poor families worked, uh, mostly undocumented people. Now, every one of those factories is now lofts, mm. 1700, 1800, mm. because the trains, the M train and it's the L good train, transportation. tremendous transportation. Now, so in these buildings that right. are walk-ups, right. but still multiple dwellings, right. poor people are living. Absolutely. Uh, most of them, a lot of them working poor people. Absolutely. Right. And they've been paying, what, $600 a month rent? They pay about $600 rent, and then somebody gets and into are the they building. Rent, wait a minute, are they rent controlled? No, they're rent, rent stabilized. stabilized. Occasionally you'll find a rent controlled tenant in them. But a rent stabilized means that the rent should be able to be increased only right. after each lease. Right. The problem that's going on is that somebody, they're buying these buildings up, and they get in there, and they start renovating them, and then immediately, if you do all the things that you're supposed to do with the state the office, rent. all of a sudden the rent is 1200 And the ordinary people can't pay 1200 Or they come in, they offer somebody... They offer them money to move. That's a, that's right. a constant thing that's happening. You know, you go in so and... If you're, if you're poor and you need some money and somebody comes along and says, what, $3,000, $4,000? Right. $5,000 even. 5000 yeah. That's then a then lot the, of money. Sure. But, but then, then where do you go? But then you relocate to a 1200 or thirteen or 1500 We go to court every day. And what goes on down in court... Now tell the, me who we is. The staff that we have. We, we, and what's I, I was what's able, the organization? I, I was fortunate to be able to, after I retired, with the help of Fran Barrett and her wonderful community organization, Community Resource Center, Community right. Resource Exchange, Exchange. That we raised money and we have five full-time workers. I'm the only one that's not paid, but all the rest are paid and they're paid well and they have health coverage. But we all opened one office in the middle of December and now we're going to open up another one in, uh, on Monday and we go to court almost every, any tenant that gets a paper from a lawyer or from the court they have to know, don't go to court alone. Don't sign a stipulation. Because if you sign a stipulation, you're held to it. And people don't understand that. Most of the stipulations are written by the landlord's lawyer who brings it to the tenant and says, sign here. And then it's brought to the judge, and he signs. I mean, give me yeah. a break. <laughs> now, we don't lose tenants. We, 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 we have avoided homelessness just in the six or eight so months now, that we've operated. Let me operated. just go back. Are they yeah. paying $600. The building is sold to a private, it's a, it's a city administered or a city owned building no. to begin with? No. No. It wasn't Some of them are. Yeah. Any, anyone that's foreclosed, a lot of right. foreclosures. So they're selling them to private owners. Right. So that they can get developed and they right. don't have to develop it. Mm -hmm. But when they sell it to a private owner, that owner comes in and not interested in maintaining the affordable housing. They want to just Absolutely. make more money. Yeah. So they do the renovations that allows them to increase, or don't they sometimes cut down the number of, of units in a building? Sure, you cut it down from six to five. It's going on all over Bushwick. Right, and then, and then what he happens? He takes the first floor and he makes it a large apartment. Yeah. And then he says it's no longer rent stabilized, which means everybody's rent suddenly is 1,200 or 1,500. So the people there can't pay the rent. No, they can't pay so the they're rent. in arrears, so then they get dispossessed notice, eviction they get notices. Dispossessed notice, eviction notice, we go with them. Not only that, but families are doubled and tripled up all over the place uh, in Bushwick. The, the number of families that live simply because they can't pay the rent. The number of people who go to food banks and places where they get food, even after they come from work, yeah. is simply because the they rents can't. are. Now, HPD. And the state, it's the housing agency, HPD, the housing agency, the city has to do, has to come in and say, this is a resource for us. We have to see to it that something happens here. Absolutely. That that good landlords, for instance, I believe that good landlords that have had their building for years, maybe they should be subsidized because some of them are walking right. away from the buildings because they can't pay all the right. buildings. They can't pay, pay all the, the bills. And the stuff. Okay, so other people then are coming in and buying, and they're doing it for speculation and. Uh, 
they, so they, you're, you think the city must adopt a policy to protect the affordable housing. They have to come out and look at that. They're and, not really building new affordable no, housing. there is no new affordable housing. So the housing. new building that's being built, instead of buildings like Neh the housing like Nehemiah houses, which yeah. were the affordable houses, right. are, are really for people who have incomes of what, 75000 100000 Yeah, at least, because the, the, new, the new things that are being built in that old Wrangell site that used to be in, in Bushwick there, yeah. You're talking about four hundred thousand dollar homes, yeah. and and you know I, that's I said not myself, for poor people. The same thing is happening in Brownsville. It's just like you just wouldn't believe it. The, the homes are beautiful, but it's not the people who are living there so that how, are getting the homes. How many of these people land up in shelters then? A number of them get into to go to go to shelters, but the but first not, stop but, but, is to double up. Well, the first stop is to double up. The the first stop with us is to go to court with them, yes. and we avoid right. that. We have become the experts of what is called jiggets which is a way to get money from the state, which they should give to all families on public assistance, but they don't. It's only if you, if you get jiggets are you allowed to pay more than you're allowed. They, they allow 286 a month for a family of three to be on for public, rent. No, for, if you're on, pub, no, if you're on if public you're assistance, on public assistance you, you, you can allow 286 for rent for a family of three. Well, I mean, it's so ridiculous. Yeah. So if you get a court order saying you're going to be evicted, then, yeah. they, then they, if you struggle, you can get jiggets. And right. then your rent may go up to. Then they may be paying as much as seven ninety, uh, uh, yes. nine fifty. Uh, and they, that goes on forever. That goes on at least for a three-year period. Right. And then the other problem is now that the city is talking about instead of putting family in shelters, is that they're just going to give people money to go out and get their own apartments. Look. Well, they get their own apartments at the beginning. Right. But but and if they're not making there. if they're <laughs> well, if, they're, yeah. if they're not making enough money to pay the rent. They're going to become homeless again in another year. So we're making policy without really looking at the, the people whole, who were affected by it. The whole thing. Now the fire that the fireman who who died in the Bronx mm -hmm. and in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. It was a Brooklyn or Queens the second fire. It was Queen. East New York. No, it was East Brooklyn. New York, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, they're saying that 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 part of that problem was that both of those houses were overcrowded. That they think there was a family living in the basement in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. but that upstairs on the top floor of the building in the Bronx, so the the owner of the building had had built walls to make bedrooms mm -hmm. and that's to accommodate poor people and some of them may not be uh, citizens mm -hmm. and they may not be documented but they're here Absolutely. <laughs> and they so, need a place to live see what, what, and what therefore happen, there's a market for what'll it. What'll happen now see is that everyone will send inspectors and the city will arrest the owner of the house right. and they will all complain about it but the problem is that... And the people that, will be out on the street. Right but the problem is really that there's no place for people to go and if people don't double and triple up, where do they go? Right. And uh, it's really a, uh, a huge problem in New York. And it's beginning to hit not just the inner city areas. We have had in the last couple of weeks people come from Middle Village, from Glendale. This, this is over by in, in Queens yeah. there in Ridgewood. Right. All, sometimes old people who were paying 450 rent for years, suddenly their rent is $1,200. they are going to become homeless. And, you know... I, I don't see any strategy at this point that's going to do something. Right. For a, a woman walked in our office the other day, just burst out crying, and she had a beautiful apartment on Myrtle Avenue in Glendale, and um, her husband lost his job. Um, she, she got put out. She didn't know about us. She got put out. She's, and, you know, it's, now, it's, these are people, I have to go back to theology and the right. fact that you're a priest and, right. and a monsignor and that right. you... Um, these are people, by and large, who still come to your church or go to St. Barbara's. Not, not do they have, how do you reconcile faith with the terrible things that happen to people? Well, I mean... Is that for, a for, terrible for, question? No, it's not. I mean, I, 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 I believe that our God is a loving God. I do not believe that God punishes any people or any... I think all that, all that happened in, the, in Asia, with those tsunami, all those things are just parts of nature that happen. Uh, but the God that I believe in, the God that I tell people about, is a God that loves us all. And these kind of things go on, and they are awful problems for us to understand, you see. But I, I think government's point is that they have to look for solutions. You can't just say that, you know, this is an awful thing that God has permitted to happen. Here we have three firemen. That's an awful tragedy. It's an awful thing for those families. But if it could have been avoided by having a housing prob a, a, a policy, 
that wouldn't have that many people. I've been in so many houses where I see, I go from the, from the kitchen down to over to the living room, and you go past all these curtains, and behind each curtain is another family. You know, I'm, you, know you say, well, all right, we should, we should, send, we should send inspectors in there and, 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 and get them out, or, or give, a, 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 give a citation to the, to the landlord. The problem is, is that people have to live, and those people are working. Right. Working hard, sometimes working 15, 16 hours a day. I mean, are they relatives that are there, or are they just are no, they just tenants? No, many times they're people from their own, uh, from their own, they're, they're mostly uh, their not country. legal, but they come from their own pueblo, from their own little town, and they know each other, and somebody yeah. gets an apartment, and then they allow other people to rent, because they'd never be able to pay $1,200 right. for an apartment. So you, um, the, the EBC organized years ago you started organizing was it around the schools or was it around housing it was no, just generally conditions just just it, we started in Bush, in Brownsville we started because there was no street signs this is the Eastern Brooklyn clergy East, no East Brooklyn congregations congregation and we started because there wasn't even street signs in, in Bush in, in Brownsville years ago uh, we had all, uh, many issues we had housing issues of uh, uh, they did urban development in Brownsville and then they left it they were going to rebuild, and then they just left it. And of course, what happened is the housing stock went down and down and down. And so then we had all this vacant land in Brownsville and in East New York. And Bishop McGovern at that time and Mayor Koch got together. And to the credit of both of them, the fact that they had a long-term relationship with each other, they started doing Nehemiah Homes. Mm. Now, the sad thing, though, is that we could have done 10,000 Nehemiah Homes, 15,000. But the, nobody wants to give up the land. And the, some of the council, I know you were on the council, but now what happens in a place like, <laughs> in, in a place like Bushwick is we weren't allowed to build one Nehemiah home because the council people there had ideas of what they wanted to do. And parts of Brownsville that should have been Nehemiah homes where they now have these $400,000 houses. I mean, but, Do they get um, campaign contributions from the builders? Uh, I don't know. I, don't, <laughs> I, I presume they do, because I, I, but again, I have no absolute proof of it, so I don't want to say absolutely sure, but I do know that these builders come in there and they make 100%. We don't make any profit building a Nehemiah home. Right. We just don't make any profit. Right. Not only that, but the different juridicatories put in the money and it becomes a revolving fund, which means that the builder, so doesn't, always... the builder doesn't even have to borrow money from a bank. Uh, That's where the biggest... Oh, cost of housing is, yeah. you know, so, no, the Nehemiah Homes, if we were able to, we could have done at least 15,000 in East Brooklyn. What is your new organization's name? It's called Bushwick Housing Independence Project, and uh, we, 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 uh, we, uh, we are just filled with energy, these young people are, I'm not, I don't have that oh, much yes, energy. Oh, yes, you are, you do, but you anyway, have the inspiration. But, um, you are, are you affiliated then with EBC? No, that's this particular group this is, is not. not. But there's two members of our staff that's going to go to the 10-day training that the EBC has, uh, that IAF has uh, four times a that's year. That's the Industrial Areas right, Foundation. Industrial Areas it's Foundation. important because it trains the, the people Absolutely. to understand power and to exert it. And how to use their time and, and what issues to go so that you don't start doing what we're doing and lose our focus. Our focus is one thing keep people we don't have money to, to give people for apartments we don't have any apartments but you we want you to keep the apartment you have and we'll do anything we can so that you can keep your apartment if you hadn't had that training or that that affiliation with IAF would you have the way of thinking that you have now probably not Probably not. I mean, there's no doubt. It I've came, been it, to the meetings of yours. It came late. And but. they, and I've also been the recipient of some okay. of the anger when I worked at the Port Authority. Uh, yeah. And uh, boy, this is a single-minded group of people uh, uh, that really directs its constituents uh, to uh, exert that power for yeah. the things that they want. And of course, that's what we need all over. Absolutely. And, and, and we don't really have any uh, real hatred or dislike for the people. We just want to see the ordinary people <laughs> get a break. I mean, I want to, we've been trying for six months to meet with the commissioner of, H, of housing preservation and development, this fellow Donovan. Um, so who's going to help us now? We have a, a group of young people from Yale, uh, the, uh, the son of the former treasury secretary, Ruben, 
uh, Jamie Rubin, he's going to get us the, the meeting with, with Donovan. Well, we shouldn't have to wait six no. months to meet with this man no. because we have we have something that he should be jumping up and down about. And you're and, all paying him his salary. Yeah, so that's really, and, and <laughs> He's and supposed like, to serve you, right? We're not going to give him a hard time. We're just going to say, why don't you come up with a program so that families, poor families, working families can have a place to so live. So who have you written to to get that? You write to Donovan to ask for a meeting? Do you write no. to the mayor? No, I haven't done that yet, but I'm going to. But, but actually, I think we're going to get the meeting soon. I hope we do, anyway. Good. So patience is a, very, is a virtue, right? It's a it's virtue. It's a virtue but sometimes, it's a virtue, but it's also... Right, because what's happening in Bushwick, what happened in Williamsburg, is, 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 is so crucial at this point, because it's all going to happen in the next couple of years. It's not going to be a gradual thing, because all of these people are coming from all over the place to, to buy these houses. Everybody wants to buy something there and, or build something. Uh, and and when that happens, the people, do the, if they are able to move someplace, where do they move to? If they're put out, you mean? Yeah. If they're put out? I don't know where a lot of them do go. I really don't know. I, don't, I, I do know that a lot of people in Bushwick and in Brownsville are moving to other states. Mm. They're moving up to Hartford. They're moving to Danbury. Pennsylvania. They're moving to Pennsylvania. A lot of them go to these cities and... Uh, public assistance there gives them. I had a wonderful family moved up to Hartford, and within three months, they had a beautiful Section 8 apartment because they didn't. Ha they they had their portion of Section 8 which they weren't even using. So I, I have no problem with that. Right. If people move up there, Father Powis, you are a joy to have, and people are very fortunate to have you, and the city is fortunate to have you, and okay. thank you very much.